Well, depending on your time zone, good morning or good afternoon, and welcome to ASA's Webinar Wednesday. This episode is PCI Compliance Made Easy with Dan Arn. You know, maintaining the security of your customer data is more important than ever before, and that's particularly true of financial transactions. Are you sure your business is PCI compliant? In this webinar, we'll explain PCI compliance, what it is, and if your business is at risk. This webinar will answer those and other questions and give you a good grasp of what your PCI risks are so that your business does not wind up a statistic. Right now, 71% of cyber attacks you know, occur at businesses with fewer than 100 employees. 50% of car holders are likely to avoid stores hit by data breaches, and 80% of small businesses that suffer a breach go out of business after 18 months, so this is a very important topic. Today's attendees will learn what PC compliance is and why it's important, what's involved in a network scan, and tips to completing an annual PCI DSS SAQ. And Dan will explain what all those acronyms mean. Uh, please note you'll also earn two AMI credits by attending this webinar. You uh, attendees will receive an email after the webinar with a link so you can take the quiz to claim your credits. Today's special guest is Dan Arndt, president of Card Connect Paradise. Dan, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Tony, and uh, thanks for having me and for hosting this event. And I wanted to thank everyone who's uh, joining us today. Okay. Um, I'm your host, Tony Mala, by the way. I'm ASA's Vice President of Industry Relations, and we do have some housekeeping tips before we get started. Uh, some tips for optimal webinar experience. You've joined this webinar in listen-only mode, which means you're on mute. For those who have dialed in by phone, please be sure to select telephone and enter your audio pin in the audio panel to eliminate any echo. And as I mentioned, you can earn two AMI credits for today's webinar. Uh, ASA webinars are eligible for AMI credit towards an industry recognized professional designation and specialty degree. And by the way, when you get there, you'll get an email from us, as I said, uh, to all attendees, we'll get one after the webinar. And when you get there, you'll be prompted to create a profile if you haven't already done so. So just be aware of that. We will be taking questions on today's webinar. Uh, in today's training session, please feel free to submit any questions in the question window. We will try to address as many questions as possible at the end of the session. If we get one in the middle that is important, I uh, will interrupt you, Dan, and ask that question. Otherwise, we will get to them at the end. How to ask a question is to simply use the question box. You can see it illustrated on the screen. Just click on the questions box. If you hit the little triangle on the left, it'll open the window. Type your question in the window and then hit send. It's that simple. So without further ado, at this point, we will give the screen to Dan Arndt for PCI Compliance Made Easy. Again, the latest installment of ASA's webinar Wednesday. Dan, take it away. Well, thank you again, Tony, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And my name is Dan Art, and I'm the president of Card Connect Paradise. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a background to, about me before we get started, so you know who you're talking to. I started in credit card processing in 1990 as a sales representative, and back then it was the knuckle buster day. Some of you uh, may, may have been around then and, and remember that you would take an imprint of the uh, credit card and have them sign it and put it in your batch with your deposit, with your checks and your cash, take it to your bank and that's how you would get your credit cards uh, uh, processed then. It was just the emergence of electronic machines starting out. So it was a, a, a wonderful time to start in the business. And then in 1992, I started uh, Card Connect Paradise and I'm an owner just like you guys. So we have 10 employees, and uh, one thing I found with my vendors is I really like to deal with the company that I can talk to the owner. I've just found the service levels way higher than when you're just dealing with an employee. Uh, so why am I sitting here today uh, talking about PCI compliance with ASA? About 10 years ago, I met Dave Riccio, the owner of Tri-City Transmissions at my men's Bible study at our church. And we became friends and we started riding bikes together and Eventually, I got Dave's statement and did an analysis of that, and I found that he had a half a percent of hidden fees in his uh, in his statement, and he was integrated with his uh, business management software at that time, but he was really upset about that. It was costing him about $600 a month, 
And so we ended up getting his business and then he referred me uh, other shop owners. He knew a lot of shop owners and had a network of friends. And we did those shops. And then about eight years ago, he introduced me to ASA Arizona. And we've got about a hundred shops with ASA Arizona on board now. And everyone's very happy, 100% satisfaction. And then about two years ago in Tucson, I met uh, Ray Fisher, the president of ASA National. And we've kept in touch and we recently agreed to have uh, Card Connect Paradise uh, and us represent ASA as a preferred credit card processor. So I just wanted to give you that background of why I'm speaking to you today. And so let's begin. And as I begin, I just want you to know this is a very complicated subject, but I'm gonna try and break it down and make it meaningful. Uh, you know, that basically it's hackers and security analysts at war 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, the hackers are trying to find holes and get into your network, get into your software, get into your credit card machines. And the security analysts are trying to patch everything up. So that's, that's the reason why you have those updates. And my presentation is four part. So first, what is PCI and what's the impl implications of that? Second's about the card elements and the entry devices. Third will be about your network if you have one, and fourth will be a solution. Okay, so uh, let's go on here. So PCI, it's not just PCI, it's PCI DSS. And what does that mean? So PCI DSS, it means Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. And basically it was developed by the five card brands to address these uh, breaches and break-ins and stolen credit card data and all those types of things. So the cost of non-compliance, fines, penalties, increased fees, lost revenues, negative marketing image. If uh, the public finds out you had a breach, it can really affect you negatively. The cost of reissuing cards, lawsuits, insurance claims. The average cost, and this includes the big companies as well as, as, well as the small, is $141 per credit card number. And the global average is $3.62 million uh, for a credit card breach. Uh, the data breach chronolog chronology, uh, 2005 card systems, another credit card processor, they were hacked for 40 million credit cards and they consequently went out of business. In 2007, TJ Maxx, you may have heard of some of these, they had 49 million credit cards stolen. Uh, 2009, Part Heartland Payment Systems, 130 million credit cards stolen. 2013 Target had 110 million credit cards, Home Depot 2014, 56 million. So there's been some really large uh, hacks and, and breaches. And then recently, this is kind of uh, pretty funny. It's, it, I, I wanted to put this in here just to lighten it up a little bit. But Twitter was actually hacked 130 accounts, including social media accounts of Barack Obama, Kanye West, Elon Musk, Joe Biden, and Bill Gates. Scammers netted $100,000 from people who had no reason to question why a celebrity would tweet, I'm giving back to the community. All Bitcoin sent to the address below will be sent back doubled. If you send 1,000, I'll send back 2,000. Only doing this for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of sayings for that sucker burn every day, but uh, they got 100,000 from that one. And then we all heard recently the Colonial Pipeline uh, $5 million ransom paid to hackers. So this is unprecedented. Uh, I, no, normally it's been, we don't negotiate with terrorists and you can consider these hackers as terrorists in a, in a way. And, and so that was just unprecedented. I had not been heard of before. So, <clears throat> so attacks on businesses like yours, 58% of all malware attacks target small businesses. Most small businesses feel like they don't have any threat but the, these statistics show you otherwise. Uh, 84 to 148,000 is the average cost of an attack on a small business. So it's not in the millions like those uh, big guys, but that's still a, a chunk of change. And 60% of small businesses close within six months and two in three do not have tools in place to prevent a cyber attack. Uh, so this is my, the next part about the card elements and the key entry devices in this section. And uh, the card now, it has a chip on it. As you can see there, there's a PAN, that's the account number, a cardholder name, expiration date. American Express has a code on the front and 
the other card payments have a code on the back. So verifying the card, it's, it's just amazing to me in the 30 years of how, I mean, I use a card all the time and at the counter, very little, if any verification is ever done. You guys are in a great place. You don't do a whole bunch of transactions. It's not like a supermarket. You got to whip people through every five seconds. You can take a little time and look at the card, especially if you don't know someone. Take, take a look at that card. Is the card signed? And you want to make sure the signature that they sign matches. You can even check driver's license. It's not in this list, but some of those jobs you do are large dollar. If you don't know these people, ask them for a, a driver's license. Uh, the expiration date has not passed. Make sure it's not an expired card. The signature on the receipt matches the card signature. The receipt does not have, does not show the full uh, 16 digit account number. By the way, does anyone know how many digits are allowed to be shown now to be PCI compliant? Is it 16? No, it used to be historically that the whole card number was printed out there. Of course, people don't always take care of their slips. So uh, cards can be spread around uh, endlessly that way. But now it's the last four digits. Only the last four digits should show on your receipt. Okay, so focus on implementing strong control measures, which, re which includes restricting physical access to cardholder data. Okay, periodically inspect all credit card devices for tampering or substitution. Never allow direct physical access to the credit card device without supervisor approval. Beware of suspicious behavior and immediately report tampering or evidence of skimming to any supervisor. That's what we recommend for your company policy. You may ask, what is skimming? Skimming is literally uh, hackers putting a device which will skim or read credit card data and transfer it to the hacker criminal. So I actually experienced this at a gas pump. There was two card swipers. I'm like, which card swiper do I use? I'm like, uh-oh, the alarm bells went off. This looks like skimming. And uh, sure enough, there was a device there, which I suspect was for skimming. I went to the counter. The guy at the counter had no idea. I'm like, hey, there's a skimming device on your gas pump. No idea what I was talking about. I took a picture. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find that for this presentation. But if you accidentally swipe your card through that skimming swiper, it will transmit your card number to the hackers and they collect them that way. Other ways, uh, other things that happen, they might switch out your credit card device. So flip over your machine, look at the serial number on the back. All machines have an individual serial number. Check that periodically. Make sure that no one swapped out your device. Uh, <clears throat> I know it sounds crazy, but it happens. Tampering or substitution. So this machine here has been tampered with. They uh, put a device inside of this machine, which will transmit credit card data to the thieves. Uh, other ways. So these machines look exactly alike, except for the cord is different, right? So you can, they can actually capture credit card data uh, with, by swapping out the cord as well. So very crafty people out there. Uh, never allow direct access to the credit card device without owner or manager approval. Always verify with your supervisor. By the way, at, there, at the end, there's uh, some of these slides are very appropriate for it to train your people. And we have a PowerPoint specifically for that to train your people at the point of sale. Uh, also, another thing I wanted to just touch upon about these devices is that we have uh, a card point, Card Connect has a card point device that is P2PE, that is point to point encrypted. And that means that it's sent directly from the manufacturer to your doorstep. We cannot take it, we cannot inventory these machines, no one else can touch it because it would not be point to point encrypted then because someone could have tampered with that device. So the most secure devices, and I think Card Connect's by far the most secure company by doing things like that. So it's coming direct from Ingenico, they manufacture credit card machines right to your doorstep. It's a special arrangement that Card Connect has made with the manufacturer to have the most secure devices. Okay, and uh, oops, am I going the wrong way? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Be aware of suspicious behavior around devices. For example, attempts by unknown persons to unplug or open the device. Uh, if you become aware of evidence of, of 
tampering or replacement or any other breach of credit card data, contact your owner manager immediately. Okay, phishing. This isn't like uh, catching fish, but they're trying to catch information, trying to get your information. So phishing emails. Uh, so be aware of um, suspicious email messages. And don't, don't open attach email attachments unless you're expecting them. Attachments can contain viruses, malware. Emails may include viruses and uh, don't click on URLs that people send you unless it is a known or safe site and re report suspicious emails. Have your people report those to you. Website safety. Malicious websites can be infected with spyware or malware and can infect your computer when you visit them. Stay away from unknown sites or sites that the antivirus software warns against. When you get those warnings, um, you may know of those sites. It's not a perfect system. I get that warning sometimes, and the site I know is safe. So you have to make a judgment call. It's, it's not an easy, it's not easy all the time. But be aware of pop-ups. They could contain spyware, and use known sites that are safe for HTTPS for personal business. So before HTTPS, it was just HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www dot world wide web dot, right? Now there's an S. So if you look in the address bar in your browser, the upper screen, you see the address bar. It may just show a lock or an unlock. And that lock is what you want. The secure site is locked. It's got HTTPS. And um, if your site doesn't have it, you should get a security certificate because people will not want to visit your site if it's not secure. Little tip there. And then spyware and malware uh, could allow an opening to steal confidential information. Okay, it's not only electronic data, so any printed data, any contracts you have, any agreements, any things you, you may write down a credit card number on a contract or agreement that could be sitting on your desk. So protect information in all its forms. Keep printed confidential information out of sight, off your desktop, off the counter. Don't leave those out there for unsuspecting eyes. And use locks on cabinets and offices appropriately. If you have credit card data, lock it up. Probably should lock it up anyways because it's got your client's name and addresses and all that stuff in there. Uh, shred documents when they're no longer required. Uh, good goal is to go paperless if you can. Uh, when speaking about confidential matter, be sure that your conversation will not be overheard. I know some of you are uh, very gregarious and great people, and you don't realize how far your voice broadcasts out there. So if you're taking credit card numbers, uh, try and be a little more discreet. And uh, another nice thing about this, as far as storing credit card numbers, the card point system that we offer, uh, when you have a merchant account with us, you only don't, only don't only get a credit card device. You have a website. Uh, you have a you can put a payment page a payment button on your website you can send invoices to your clients you can do recurring billing you can store their credit card information bill them monthly if you want to make a payment plan or if they just call you they're a good customer yeah you want me to run that on the card on file all stored completely secure with no risk to you whatsoever all that's included so so don't even keep the printed forms around just store it into our gateway uh, ways to protect card data. Never share your password with anyone. I don't know if you guys are aware, but the Democratic National Convention was hacked when one of the higher-ups gave out the password over the phone to someone. They got hacked. So this is probably the most common way that hacks happen. Uh, your system is usually pretty secure if you have a decent password, but most of the time these breaches happen by someone actually giving the password to a criminal. So keep your desk clear of any sensitive information or passwords and so forth. Always properly dispose of paper records with cardholder data using crosscut shredders or approved shred shredding bins. And don't allow unauthorized individuals around PCI devices. Be alert if you're unsure about what could be a risk. Ask your owner manager. Uh, PCI, because now we're talking about your network and network requirements. If you have one, if you have more than one computer hooked together, that's a network. Uh, PCI, DSS requirements. On the right is the requirements. There's 12 requirements. And the left is the goals. So the goals are to build and maintain a secure network and system, protect cardholder data, maintain a vulnerability management program, 
implement strong access control measures, and regularly monitor and test networks and maintain an information security policy. So protect all systems against malware and regularly update antivirus software. Make sure you update. So many people do not update. And it's not only improvements to the program in these updates, but also patches, which are important to keep hackers out. Uh, develop and maintain a security systems applications. Problem with doing the, uh, the mouse there, jumped a little ahead. Install and maintain a firewall a configuration to protect data. Very important that you have a firewall that's updated and, and maintained. And do not use vendor supplied uh, defaults for system passwords and other systems. Don't use password or the vendor supplied password. And maybe it's one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four. Hackers know this. They know the vendor supplied passwords. Make sure you change those. Uh, avoid missing or outdated security patches. We recently had to do a major upgrade of our network because of Windows 7. We had uh, many Windows 7 PCs and we had servers that were 2008 server. Microsoft uh, backs those or up, provides updates for those for about 10 years, usually a little bit over that, but we were coming towards the end of 10 years and our IT professionals told us, listen, you need to upgrade everything because the software is not going to be supported anymore, which means they're not going to send updates anymore, which means you're not going to get patches anymore. No patches means holes, means they can get into your network. So the TLS 1.2, thousands, we had to update thousands of credit card machines for that because there was a patch in there and all these machines needed to, to have a, uh, download to get the security into there. That was a big, big deal. Uh, a little interesting thing on passwords and complexity. If you had a password, just burger, lowercase, hackers can just about instantly get into that. But if you add the number one, numeric character one, it'll take 19 seconds. But an uppercase burger with the number one, 14 minutes. One, two, three burger, now it's getting longer, the password's getting longer, it takes seven hours. And then uppercase burger, one, two, three, 39 days. Hamburger, one, two, three, much longer, like 12 characters there, 37 years. Burger and fries, now we're introducing those special, special characters, the ampersand, 64,000 years. Burger and fries in the number 126 million years. Capital burger and fries, one, two, three, 98,000 years. So I thought that was very interesting. I wasn't aware of that until I did this presentation. But keep your, try and make your uh, passwords a little longer, adding numer numerous numbers in there, and a special character doesn't hurt as well. But getting around 10, 12 characters, you've got a good password. Uh, restrict access to cardholder data by business need to know. So if you have uh, personnel who doesn't, don't work with the credit card information, don't allow them access to that. If they don't run, if they're not running cards or charges, they probably shouldn't have access to that. Assign a unique ID to each person with computer access. Uh, so many companies, they just all use one login. Uh, when you do that, you'll have no idea who made the error. There's no audit trails. There's no way to keep people, users accountable. Uh, and so then also restrict uh, physical access to cardholder data. We talked about that locking file cabinets if you do have physical copies and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> regularly monitor and test networks, track all networks, all access to network resources and cardholder data. Uh, regularly test security systems and processes. Uh, maintain an information security policy. This is a written document and it's Part of being PCI compliant, you're supposed to have a written information security policy, which will describe your policy. Uh, okay, so now we're getting into being compliant. So PCI compliance audit, there's a self-assessment or a QSA, self-assessment questionnaire. This first thing to determine is the level of merchant you are. So there's merchants more than 6 million transactions. That's not going to be most of us. But this level one, they, they're the only ones that requires an on-site PCI data security analyst to go assess that, that, that location, assess that business. 
and quarterly network scans. Level two, level three, level four, most of us are gonna be level four, less than 20,000 e-commerce yeah, transactions in general, and uh, quarterly scans and self, uh, self-assessment, that self-assessment questionnaire. That's required for PCI compliance. What is the self-assessment questionnaire? There's eight of them here on the grid on the right. You read this description, you see which one describes your business most closely. You need to uh, have an at- attestation of compliance is required as part of the SAQ. So to be PCI compliant, big word, a lot of words for, you just gotta pass that test successfully. Uh, one thing nice here, we will help you with that if you, if you need it. We help a lot of shops with that. A PCI compliance checklist. Identify your merchant category. That was where we determined merchant level four, right? And limit your PCI scope using network segmentation and tokenization and hosted payment pages. Document your systems and procedures. Contract with an ASV to perform quarterly scans. Identify who will perform the audit, you or a QSA, security agent. Perform the audit. Remediate, that means when you perform the audit, you go through the the questionnaire, something's not right, you need to remediate or fix it in order to get your attestation of compliance. In other words, to complete it successfully, you have to have it corrected and have it right. Uh, PCI DSS helpful links. Uh, There's PCISecuritystandards.org, many helpful links on there. American Express, Discover, JCB, MasterCard, Visa, they all have PSI helpful links and helpful, good, helpful information there. This is something we have in our uh, security awareness training has, and you can take this and we'll, we'll have this available for you all. It'll be this presentation, but mostly the stuff at just at the point of sale. You can have your supervisor run your people through it and then sign off that they understand security awareness and they've been through the security awareness training. This would be the last page of that document. Uh, Card Connect and Secure Trust. So we have uh, partnered with Secure Trust to provide PCI security. And what's included with that, this is more of a self, there's two levels to this. Uh, There's a self protection level, which I think most all of you will be good with. You You can do it with yourself, especially if you have us or someone else to help you we can get you through this. Okay, the PCI, what's included is PCR wizard and task tracking to-do list to help you complete the process easily. A vulnerability scanning for your website, if required, to identify network weaknesses. The security policy advisor to help you design your own set of security policies, a required a requirement of PCI compliance. That's a written document that has your security policy policies uh, written down. And we have, a, we can do that with you. And then easy to use online security awareness education courses for frontline employees. You can do that. You can also use our presentation that we, we did today. Access the Secure Trust endpoint protection. So additional layer of, of uh, protection above and beyond your firewall and your antivirus software, your malware, uh, all those things. <clears throat> Expedited support by phone or email, as well as online help and tutorials. So that's more of a self-serve level. We do, there's an upgraded level. And this would be for large companies that have a large uh, internet presence and they definitely would need a little more help for this. Uh, they, they have probably IT people who can do this, but the, even the IT professional needs help from a security advisor because it gets pretty hard, hairy and it can be very complex. So Secure Trust will contact you to discuss your PCI status and explain the PCI concierge service to you or most likely your network professional and schedule an appointment to go through the network, schedule follow-up appointments as needed. And the feature includes one-on-one walk through the Secure Trust PCI analyst, fully supported SAQ completion. So we'll go through that, determine where you need to remediate or fix things and get them fixed. Scan, uh, scan setup if applicable, endpoint security download, that, that extra layer of protection, support for completing PCI attestation of compliance. That is the AOC, not the one you're thinking of, but this one means you're, uh, you're protected, your network's good, 
and that that lasts for a year. Okay. And then uh, before I leave, I want to just tell you a little bit about Card Connect Paradise. We again go base our base our uh, our business is based on service. That's how we've gotten ahead. And we have a perfect five-star rating with BBB and Google. And just one complaint in the last three years with the Better Business Bureau. Others are just usually one star and can have tens or hundreds or even thousands of complaints. And the same is true with their, their Google rating. So we have very extremely high rating. I wanna thank you for attending and uh, would love to help you out if you'd like to. We have a free PCI support, as I said, 25% minimum many have lowered their fees cut their fees in half with our service and free emv chip card machine personal service and support 100 percent satisfaction guaranteed you can cancel at any time so you can try us out for a month whatever um, and keep your keep your current processor if you're uncomfortable with that some of the messages from our happy clients there's two of my favorites dave charest at dnd auto i was skeptical at first i'd heard all the promises of lower rates which you all have. I know you guys get bombarded with us every day. Uh, Card Connect has come through with what they said they would do. They have reduced my credit card fees by over 50%. Not uncommon. We do that all the time. Uh, Jimmy Alira, 3A Automotive, absolutely the best service and best credit card processing platform I've seen. And he goes on. Uh, we've got hundreds of, re of, uh, of reviews like that. I could share with you as well as you can contact these people personally if you like. And besides that, you can try it, no, no obligation. Give it a try and you can cancel it anytime if you don't like it. We haven't had anyone cancel yet. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you everyone for attending. And um, let me know if you have any questions. Well, Dan, thank you for that presentation. It was great. Um, okay. Actually, there are a number of questions here. So uh, if you'll... Uh, Bear with me here, we'll get started. You know, the first one I have is, um, besides the obvious disadvantages of not being PCI compliant, that is very unhappy customers, are there any actual civil or criminal penalties involved for a business that isn't PCI compliant if, the, if they have a huge breach or something? No, I'm not aware of any civil or criminal penalties for that. I, I think if there could be a case be made if you had done something fraudulent uh, you know, there's, that's always on the board, but you know, I've, I've not never heard of that. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, well, a couple of the questions I have basically are um, related to some of the some of the stuff that you said during the presentation. Um, I was surprised to see some of the uh, actual easy ways it looked like to me that that people can tamper with credit card machines, etc. Um, how big of a problem is that? I know I've heard the story about you know, the, the skimmer at the gas pumps. And I, I'm always, you know, I, I'm aware of the gas pump problem. I'm always, always paying attention to what's going on there. But how common is this uh, in the, you know, out, out in the real world? How often do people unwittingly encounter a credit card skimmer and never know it until it's too late? Do you have any statistics on that? I don't have any statistics on that. Just from my experience and my gut, I don't think it's extremely common. However, I would think it would even be more common, just another black eye on our industry of a, another credit card company coming in and swapping out your machine just to get your processing. I have heard of that because uh, mm -hmm. these guys, people are ruthless and you could see that in the bad complaints in our industry. So mm -hmm. I would be more worried about that, but it's not a bad idea to take a look at your, uh, your, your, uh, secure, your um, in inventory number on the on the device to, and, and take a look at that once in a while and just pay attention and, and get this training. Have your people go through it. You learn this stuff, put your people through this as well. So they're aware of it. And then you're, you're going to really be in good shape. Hmm. Well, and again, I know, um, and, and I want to get to the individual training. I'll say that for, for a, a little bit later, because I wanted to go into some of the more macro issues. Um, one of the things that uh, you had mentioned, um, we, I know when, before we, we got started or actually after you got started, you were showing some of the, uh, some of the big data breaches, you know, that happened. And a lot of the data breaches that I've heard of have always seemed to be at a large company, you know, and I know one of the statistics you showed is that actually a lot of data breaches take place at, at smaller companies. How are companies notified if, if they are hacked and they're not aware of it? 
how do they how do they usually find out about it? Is it when a customer actually calls them to complain, or is something like their financial institution also aware of this sort of thing and watching out for you? Is there any kind of any kind of notification process that a business can rely on if again one of the larger you know credit card companies themselves or or are hacked? Yeah, it's really difficult to know that you're hacked. It's very, very difficult um, because the, the information is stolen, but it's not usually immediately used. But somehow, I, it's probably above my pay level. These security analysts, these um, computer people are genius enough that they can track down this stuff and figure out where it came from. But it's a very difficult process to find out where, it, where, it's, where it's getting hacked. Uh, they're getting better and having security in place is, is probably helps them find it as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's not an easy, easy to find out. Yeah. Well, and I've been the victim of this myself. I know um, when I, I previously lived in Virginia and there was a Home Depot near the house. And it seemed like three times I, over the course of the time I was there, um, I had to have my credit card changed because they were, you know, they had announced the data breach and, and my card was one of them. And I think that's the biggest hassle that um, most consumers encounter. A lot of them have protections against this sort of thing, I guess. But but just the process of replacing a credit card is it is it itself not worth you know being careless, if you will. But you had covered a couple of things that employees need to be aware of, and one of the things that struck me was um, the fact that printed materials. I think this is something we often ignore uh, at our pearl where a say a shop foreman or a service consultant might inadvertently jot down a credit card number, say on a work order, things like that. Um, or you just, as you said, you're taking a phone message uh, over the phone, you jot down the number on a piece of paper and forget to throw the piece of paper away, or worse, you throw the piece of paper away, but you don't shred it or anything like that. So I think a high level of, of awareness about those sorts of things is important, but, when it comes to the actual written policies, okay, that you have to have, again, um, to be PCI compliant, you, you have to have a written policy and the training you had mentioned. But again, the, from what I, I, I understand, there's no actual enforcement of that. Basically, this is a business owner's responsibility to, to, to be that responsible to get it done. Is that correct? That's correct. There's uh, fines and penalties, and those will be on your processing statement. You can see it as not a PCI non-compliance, and mm -hmm. it's, it runs from $35 to $50 a month. Uh, you'll be, <clears throat> you'll have a fee for that on your statement, and that's that's pretty much all they're doing at this point. Those Interesting. Fines. Wow. Well, and you know, um, I know we've talked a lot about email security uh, in other presentations that we've done, and it's so true. And forgive me if this is a dumb question, but um, is it possible if you're, I know most shops have a, basically an office network, how tied into those networks are your uh, credit card processing systems typically? I mean, is it possible for a hacker to actually get credit card information by hacking into, you say, your shop network where you have customer information? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, for sure. So you need to have make sure your firewall is in place, make sure you have antivirus software, anti-malware, all these uh, methods that they have to break in. You have to make sure you update. If you don't, you're leaving potential holes, you're leaving holes that potentially could be hacked into. So, I mean, they're doing it, you see it in the news. You do only hear about the large ones, but there's a lot more small ones that just don't make the news. Um, I, you know, I, I want you to sleep at night. If you have a reputable network person, you're probably in decent shape. If you don't, you better get one. Uh, it's not that expensive to have someone maintaining your network nowadays and helping you out. I know, unless you're, you know, you know that stuff, but if you're like me, I'm not a network professional. I know a little bit. I do have a, uh, a MIS degree, a degree in uh, management information systems, which is a computer degree. However, I would never trust myself with, with maintaining our network here. So. You need you need a good security, good IT support for if you do have a network. Yeah, me neither. I, I know what you mean. We think so the professionals. Um, something else, a question. You may or may not know the answer to this, but I was actually uh, impressed by the uh, information you had presented on passwords. I had no idea that uh, they, you know, obviously the longer the password, the more secure it is. I would imagine. 
but I was uh, I was always under the impression that it was actually easier than what your data showed to hack into a password. Um, I know most of us, you had mentioned anything 10 to 12 characters is, is probably okay, but I know a lot of people uh, stop at eight digits or nine digits. Is, is there some sort of, I mean, it, is a good, you know, nine digit password or eight digit password that includes say, you know, caps and lowercase and special characters, are they, are they relatively secure or do you really need to think about it should be at least 10 characters? Do you have any feelings on that? Well, I think you need to think of what you're protecting. Our network password is 10, 12 characters, but you know, my Facebook password or things like that, they're, they're not so large. Usually I'm using like an eight character password with, with the special characters, a couple numbers in there. And that, mm -hmm. that's, that's usually good enough to do it. But if you, you just don't want anyone in your network, you want it to be 64,000 years, not even 32 years that I cracked that one, right? So I think it depends on, I don't think you need a 12 character for everything. And the chances are remote, but you just don't want any chance on your network, right? Yeah, spend yeah, really. Much money, not too much money maintaining it. It's your core of your business. You just want to protect that thing. Well, plus these days, you know, uh, consumers are much more aware of their data privacy. In fact, there's quite a bit of discussion going on in Washington, D.C. about that, that we're monitoring very closely uh, because uh, there's a lot of information that is now being stored on vehicles, even uh, in the center stack. You know, if your cell phone connects with your um, uh, with your car automatically when you get in it, chances are it has a lot more information in there than you're aware of. And the individuals that have access to that information uh, at this point, I don't know if there's any real uh, qualifications or or certifications that you have to have. It's something the interest is talk, industry is talking about. But back to passwords for a second. I know I've heard a lot of talk about passphrases being popular these days. Are passphrases any more secure than it's just a, a standard, you know, alphanumeric with with special characters? Well, when you don't have an air. Uh, alphanumeric or a number, a numeric character or a special character, you're not as secure. It's much, much easier to get in. So you do want to mix in at least one uh, uh, number. And you saw, you saw through the example when they put three numbers in, it just went up, it jumped astronomically. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the phrase isn't going to be as secure as uh, putting in the special characters and the alphanumeric or the numeric. Oh, interesting. Okay, I'm glad I asked that question. That clears that up. Um, tell me a little bit My, more about these quotes. Kind of a genius. He's, a, uh, he's an electrical engineer. He's graduating early. He's getting his master's already. And he's interesting because he'll put in, instead of an S, he'll put a dollar sign. Instead of an I, he might put the number one in. And um, those are some ways you can make your passwords much better just by sneaking them in that way. And, and it's really, really good. I, I wouldn't have thought of that myself. So if you do have S's or uh, I's in there, think about putting a dollar sign or a number one in there. It's going to make your password immensely more complex by doing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that, that, right? That's the problem. We got so many passwords. It's it's a nightmare. Yeah, the bigger need... challenge, bigger challenge I know is from um, individuals that have so many passwords they're afraid to forget them, so they write them down in books mm -hmm. that they put in their desks and make it really easy. For anybody who's cleaning up at night to have access to their entire lifestyle. So yeah, back to that written document thing. It, it's really important that you um, uh, you are aware of just all the different places that you're vulnerable to have these things exposed. Um, the yeah, quarterly like network scans. Instead of writing it on paper, we all have phones now. My phone requires a finger pen. It may require, require your face to get into it. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll put. I have a note in my phone that I keep them on. So. No, I probably shouldn't publicize that, but it might, it might help you out as far as having at least more secure than a piece of paper in your desk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, these are common problems. I think that uh, a lot of uh, businesses have that don't even realize. They just don't ask. Um, the quarterly network scans you talked about, can you tell me a little bit more about what does that involve? It literally will uh, get, grabs your IP and it goes into your network. It'll scan it. It'll look at your firewall. It looks at your virus protection. It looks at all kinds of stuff. And it's going to have some recommendations. I don't think I've had anyone who's had the scan that didn't have at least one recommendation. And it could just be, hey, you haven't updated your antivirus protection. You need to do that. Or 
you know, who knows, it's, you know, it's something on your firewall, you need to change some configurations or some uh, settings. So you're always in the best practices uh, settings and, and, and those change also. So that's why the quarterly scan, we're looking at it because the networks evolve, they grow, you add new software, you add new PCs, new components. It needs to, to keep that, keep looking at that. So this is something beyond what we would normally think of as a as a virus scan that we get from our antivirus program then, right? It's a lot more in-depth. Right. Yep. It's not looking. Virus scan usually will look at just one machine. Uh, this looks at your entire network, everything connected to that network. Hmm. Any thoughts on uh, the most common mistake that you, you found businesses make uh, you know, on top of that we're discussing? What are some of the common errors to look out for? Hmm, that's a good question. Let's see. What? Something that jumped to my mind is not really applicable, but um, I think I think probably not having being secure with their password, you know, giving that to people that they shouldn't, mm -hmm. and um, that, that's probably the most common error. That, that as far as breaches, I, I think I said it in my presentation. The stuff's pretty secure. I mean. I've heard a network professional tell me you need if you had a spoon, you'd have to tunnel. It's like tunneling uh, 30 feet under your building with a spoon. It would take mm. that long. Now that's a 64,000 years to break the password, right? But it's the human element. Generally, the computers are pretty good. It's our element. We trust someone. We give them a password, and that's even these big, big breaches. The Democratic Convention, uh, someone gave the password out, and that's that's how Russia was able to hack that thing. And that's generally what happens. Um, you know, the best thing you can do is make sure if you have a network, make sure it's secure. And that's by having a good IT person. If you trust your IT person, um, we, we have a really good, if you need a recommendation, our IT people are great. I was paying way more for it. And it's, it's $500 a month now. And, and that's for pretty much everything. We haven't gone over that. There, there's things that could go over. If you get a machine, they have to install it. It might be a couple hundred bucks to do that or something, but generally, and, and it's been awesome. Our network has worked so well, everything's working. So if you, if you find someone like that, it's goal and hang on to those people. Hmm. Well, it sounds like the, the most common problem is as usual, the human element. That's usually yeah. where most breaches occur, which uh, uh, brings us back to emphasize the, uh, the training of your staff. Uh, you actually made some great suggestions there. Um, how frequently should one uh, go over uh, the data security protocols within a business. Is that something you should do like maybe once a quarter or once a month? How, obviously, when you hire someone new, it should be part of your, your intake process, I would think. But um, uh, how, how, any recommendations for how frequently one should take the time with it and have a shop meeting and talk about this stuff? Yeah, I would say at least annually and definitely every time you get someone new, they need to go through it. Um, but that's what I'd recommend. Hmm, interesting. Well, um, those are all the questions that I have. Dan, thank you. This has been a great presentation, lots of great information, and uh, we will look forward to uh, uh, taking a look at the recorded version. A lot of the information that you've seen, uh, this, this uh, uh, webinar will be recorded and you'll be able to refer back to it. Uh, Dan, if they wanted to get a hold of you with any questions, do you have an email or a phone number you're willing to share? Yeah, absolutely. Are you able to go back to that slide with my um, information? The last slide in the uh, actually no, but if it's if it's on the last slide in the part in the uh, presentation, we'll have it in the recording. That's fine. Okay, great. Yeah, it's on the last slide. It's Dan at F as in first, D as in data, I as in igloo, S as in Sam, P as in Paul, FDISP.com. Dan at FDISP.com. And phone number 289-480-289-6304. Uh, Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, when when uh, Ray said, hey, Dan, I want you to do a, pre a presentation on PCI, he said it so casually. Little I knew it was going to be so much work. <laughs> <I probably laughs> 30 hours of work, and I felt like I was back in college. And I'm 58, so it's hard to go back to college. Uh, I, I hear you. Yeah. Well, you know, but, what's that I, saying? You know, if it was easy, everybody do it, right? So, <laughs> well, you did a great job. Again, um, this has been uh, this has been one of the better presentations. I know we've had lots of interest in this, and we will look forward to talking with you again down the road. As you had mentioned, 
you know, it's good to revisit this stuff periodically. So don't be surprised if you get another phone call from either me or Ray. So. Absolutely. I'm here to do an update. Anything to support you guys. I, I love it. Well, that's great. Well, Dan, thanks again. Uh, we have been watching a PCI Compliance Made Easy with Dan Arndt. And uh, again, another of our Wednesday webinars. We are next one coming up will be on October 20th from noon to 1 p.m. And this one's going to be on best secrets to grow your car count. Presenters Tim Ross, president and co-founder of Madison Sosby, digital marketing strategist and upswell marketing. You know, it's a competitive market for automotive repair and growing the business requires a focus on reaching out to your current and potential customers. In this webinar, you'll discover the perfect integrated marketing plan for your shop. You'll also learn how to utilize your shop's data successfully in your marketing tactics from industry experts. Registration is now open. You can go to asashop.org slash ASA hyphen webinars to register for our next webinar Wednesday presentation. Among other duties at ASA here, I'm also the host of the ASA podcast. It's a original podcast covering topics that's what's now, what's new, and what's next in the business of automotive service and collision repair. It's a weekly podcast series from ASA. Uh, you'll get some of the latest industry news, both mechanical and collision, timely legislative info, and you'll hear from industry insiders and leaders. And of course, it's available 24-7, 365 wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can listen now at asashop.org. Just search for podcasts and you'll find the ASA podcasts. Again, uh, we've been talking with Dan Arndt, PCI Compliance Made Easy. As I mentioned, a recorded session of the webinar is available to ASA members only. If you're not currently an ASA member listening to this podcast, we'd love to have you as part of the family. Uh, associations are becoming more important with the complexity of everyday life, certainly within the technology of our industry, and ASA is there to help drive your success. Uh, if you can join ASA at, at our website at asashop.org, or if you want to know more, just give us a call at 817-514-2901, and we'll be happy to talk to you about the many ways ASA helps drive your success. Again, Dan, thanks again for your time today. We will talk to you soon, we hope. Everyone have a great day and we'll talk to you next time on the ASA webinar.